Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM released its results this week against the backdrop of serious corruption allegations and questions of its financial health. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the state of the embattled utility. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The Tegeta contract and arbitration award, Machila Koko's future and the McKinsey and Trillion contract all featured prominently in this week's results. Yes, the results were entirely overshadowed by all these allegations um, of corruption and maladministration. And uh, those three points did come up uh, uh, very prominently. I think a lot of um, questioning was uh, given to this to get a relationship again. And we know that th that's really that cloud hasn't been lifted uh, from Eskimo. In fact, more questions have now been raised around the arbitration award of that was so much lower. The initial claim by Eskimo against Glencore at the time was the owner of Optimum. It was subsequently put into business rescue and then bought out of business rescue by Tegeta. was over two billion. It ended up that uh, Tegeta only, uh, through after arbitration, only faced a, a claim or a fine uh, for low coal quality of, um, of 500 million or, or quite a lot, lot lower than that. So th th there's a question around how did they get to that figure and there was quite a mind-boggling explanation around the fact that a crusher was installed in 2010 which led to a whole lot of false positives in terms of low coal quality and actually that coal would have been acceptable under the old regime which I think just didn't wash uh, with anyone at the uh, function yesterday. And then the, the bombshell announcement that actually uh, over and above the prepayment that we know that Tegeta got around 650 million to help facilitate uh, them purchasing that mine it seems and not just opening up a new section to supply a separate contract to supply on it, because uh, Optimum always supplied the Andrina power station. Um, they also received a 1.6 billion rand guarantee from Eskom um, through the APSA bank, which was never triggered and never used and was ultimately withdrawn. But I mean, it just seems like the red carpet was laid out um, for the Gupta linked company to buy Optimum out of business rescue. So there's a lot of questions that still have to be answered. And it was also quite uh, embarrassing, the fact that when these questions were asked, that the people that were sitting at the time on the board at the moment, September Corsa is the chairman of the company, but was in the board previously, which has been rotated and revamped somewhat, um, said he, he had no recollection of that 1.6 billion uh, rand guarantee. So, uh, it, uh, you know, the, the mind did boggle yesterday around just that Tegeta element. Then, as you mentioned, it took so long to get to these disciplinary charges against uh, Marcello Coco, the previous interim CEO. At least there, I think we're seeing that the board has, has finally dispatched or put the charges together and now dispatched those, and there will be a labor relations process that, un that gets undertaken there. Again, uh, it seems to be a, a serious conflict of interest where um, his stepdaughter was a, a, um, a shareholder in a company that was awarded massive amounts of business um, for a small company under Marcello Coco's control. So that, that I think is going to be ventilated correctly. We also know in the courts there's this whole ventilation of the Brian Malefic uh, contract, the pension payout and that debacle, which wasn't so much a, a feature this week. And then I think the other movement that we saw was around this McKinsey Trillion contract and how it came about that nearly uh, a payment of nearly half a, a billion rand, um, 495 million rand to trillion was, was made by Eskom, despite the fact that Eskom never had a contract with this company and only had a contract with McKinsey to, to do the turnaround plan and other corporate support. Um, now Eskom claims um, that this was a subcontractor relationship between McKinsey and Trillion and that they were merely asked by um, McKinsey to please pay their subcontractor directly being Trillion. Now Trillion again has these Gupta family links. McKinsey has denied that strongly and said that they actually never entered into any subcontract relationship with Trillion and uh, have disputed um, Eskom's version of events. Both companies um, to their credit now have instituted proper investigations of that contract. So we know that McKinsey's taking their own processes. Eskom announced yesterday that they are doing the same, that they are going to investigate this whole trillion matter. 
uh, McKinsey matter and that they have suspended McKinsey as a supplier in the meantime. So there seems to be s some movement, movement there, but this whole issue of, um, of corruption is, is dragging down the reputation of Eskom. It seems they haven't got their mind around everything that's been laid before them. And although there does seem to be some, some process, processes to, to deal with some of the really big fires on this burning platform that is Eskom's reputation, that it, I think many participants left uh, the presentation this week with as many questions as answers. Another key topic was related to whether it is acceptable for Anoush Singh to still be in the CFO hot seat given his role in the so-called state capture contracts. Yeah, yes, I think that was one of the hottest areas of, of debate. Eskim claims that uh, they've been taken into confidence by Mr Singh and that they feel that there's no justification to suspend uh, him at the, at the moment and they point to a fairly good performance from his, u from his unit within the business. Um, and they felt uh, that his explanations to the board so far have been uh, sufficient. Mr Singh himself has given an indication that he's drafting what he calls a tell-all document, uh, which details this so-called relationship with the Gupta family. We know that uh, through these Gupta leaked e uh, leaks emails, that he did go to Dubai on a couple of occasions at the Gupta family's expense. And there seems to be some sort of correlation between the time frames. One, uh, when he was involved at the CFO's Transnet, afterwards uh, there was some locomotive contracts around the China South Rail that may have gone, uh, may be benefiting a Gupta-linked company. And then two, obviously this optimum to get a deal. There seems to be you know, the timing seems suspicious, but he claims that he's going to be doing a full disclosure and he needs some time to do that, uh, draft that document. That disclosure is going to be given to the Minister, the Board, to SCOPA, to the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises and to the media. So we await that with bated breath. But in the meantime, he sits there in the position and there are questions as to whether that is uh, prudent for Eskom given the reputational damage that's or that is swirling around the company, whether it wouldn't be better to do what they did and eventually with Michele Coco and ask him to step aside so that uh, uh, investigations can take their course. But for the time being, they're holding firm uh, and, and uh, giving, their, um, giving a lot of credit to the, to the information that he's obviously given to them privately. There's also the issue of ESCOM's financial st sustainability. Is the company broke? Well, that's, that was the headline of last week, that um, Eskom has really facing serious financial risk. On the face of it, <coughs> that doesn't seem to have been borne out in the report yesterday. Yes, there was a massive drop in profit, net profit. So we had a sort of 5 billion net profit in 2016. It's come all the way down to below a billion rand. But on, uh, I think that there was a lot of effort given, uh, particularly by uh, Anoj Singh, to explain on the um, EBITDA line that the company actually did improve by about 14% and that uh, it is a cash generative business, that no going concern uh, issues were flagged by the auditors uh, during the financial the preparation of the financial results. There were other issues flagged um, by auditors that actually led to the delay in the results, it seems, around both uh, Marcello Coco and Brian Molefe. Those related to PFMA, which is the Public Finance Management Act, and whether ESCOM is fully, uh, you know, in step with that. And those two issues were raised by the auditors, um, uh, but there was an emphasis that on the actual the financials, there was no going concern risk. Now, um, there, there was is the questions have you know intensified over the last week because. Uh, in the process of releasing his 14-point stimulus plan, the finance minister, Lucy Gagaba, spoke about Eskom's hardship and its weakening balance sheets. <coughs> so obviously there's a feeling, well, we're getting, he's getting us ready for another bailout of Eskom. So there's going to be a lot of eyes on the medium-term budget policy statement, no doubt, in October to see whether there is any bailout of Eskom. But this seems to be confined to the issue of whether uh, Eskom has sufficient financial resources to pay for the RPPs, 
in my mind, there's no doubt that they, they, in the MIPD they have actually been over-recovering from the IPPs and that there is no stress related to the, the renewables IPPs. But if you look forward, and the fact that there is this logjam in the, uh, the tariff setting process with the RCAs, which is these, this way of clearing yearly where there's either been over-recovery or under-recovery by Eskom, there has been a logjam there. It's been in the legal process and there may even be a constitutional court challenge around the recent Supreme Court of Appeal finding in favour of NERSA and Eskom in this regard, which will delay things further. There may be a point where Eskom might need some support under the government framework agreement. So the government framework agreement, the way, um, the way renewables are procured in South Africa is they are procured through the Department of Energy uh, with a fixed price given by the, the renewable supplier. Um, that price is paid by Eskom as the single buyer through the, through the tariff. Um, if there's a problem in the tariff not being aligned, then the, there's an ultimate guarantee by the taxpayer in the form of this government framework agreement up to, I think, about 150 billion, where that the, the, this, the, this um, electricity is guaranteed that Eskom will be able to buy it. So what the consumer may be short uh, in, in paying the IPPs, the taxpayer has to come in and offer that relief. But I don't think we're there yet, and maybe it's one of these boxes that can be easily ticks, ticked on the 14-point plan. Um, but it, it, that, I think, and Eskom is also unclear as to what self-support um, uh, Minister Malusi Gagabo is talking about. But that, uh, it seems to be, that seems to be the, the point that of debate rather than a new set of guarantees or a new set of injections. We've, you know, Eskom's already had a lot of support from the taxpayer over the last few years as we descended into this crisis at Eskom. And uh, so I don't think there's anything imminent. Well, that's what Eskom's telling us, and but we need to get some clarity from the finance minister as what he sees as the soft support. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.